ABC News Live. A potentially dangerous close call for two U.S. Navy warships. Video shows them appearing to be on a collision course, narrowly avoiding a disaster. Now there's an investigation into just what happened. A panel of judges has just ruled to overturn the appointment of a special master tasked with reviewing thousands of documents seized by the FBI from former President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate, what it means for the next steps of the criminal investigation. Rail strike averted. A bipartisan majority of senators passed a House bill forcing a labor agreement to avert a looming strike of the nation's railway workers, but two additional provisions didn't make it past the chamber. The reactions from union leaders. An alarming scene at a middle school as seven patients are rushed to the hospital. Officials say at least 10 students were potentially exposed to drugs, what authorities say could be the cause. Warnings for shoppers this holiday season as online scams reach an all-time high. The signs you should be looking out for and the best strategies to make sure your personal information is safe. He was once worth an estimated $20 billion as CEO of cryptocurrency giant FTX. Now the company is filing for bankruptcy. In his first network interview since his company's collapse, former CEO Sam Bankman-Fried talks about what he says led to FTX's downfall and the speculation about if he could face prison time. At the end of the day, you know, it's not my call what happens and uh, the world will judge me as it will. With millions of dedicated followers and countless viral videos, Manny MUA is a bona fide beauty guru. He's created a community by breaking stigmas and redefining the standards of beauty. I think a lot of people gravitate towards people who just are themselves, who want to express themselves the way that they want to. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We have breaking news tonight involving the Justice Department's investigation into former President Trump and classified documents found at Mar-a-Lago. The 11th Circuit Court of Appeals has removed a major obstacle to the ongoing investigation and shut down the special master review of documents seized from Mar-a-Lago. The unanimous ruling by a three-member panel of the court made it clear that the judge stepped widely outside of her jurisdiction in appointing a special master in the first place and said, quote, the law is clear. The move comes as former President Trump continues to face ongoing investigations on a variety of fronts. The chairman of the House committee, who now has possession of some of Trump's tax returns, says he has designated staffers to review them. All of this comes as the former president has announced his intentions to run for president again in 2024, sparking Attorney General Merrick Garland to appoint a special counsel to deal with the sprawling Justice Department investigation. Let's get straight to our Chief Justice Correspondent, Mr. Pierre Thomas, who's in Washington tonight with more on this breaking news. So, Pierre, explain the significance of this ruling and what it means for the investigation of the former president. Lindsay, it's another rebuke of the federal judge overseeing Justice Department's Mar-a-Lago document investigation. An appeals court tonight ruling that there's no need for a special master to oversee any of those documents Trump took from the White House and to resolve issues of privilege. The appeals court concluding that Judge Aileen Cannon cited no legitimate case law and questioned whether f former President Trump should be treated any differently than any other criminal defendant. The appeals court had previously overturned a ruling by Judge Cannon blocking DOJ from using classified documents seized from Mar-a-Lago. The latest ruling means the DOJ could soon have unfettered access to all those documents taken in the search of Trump's property, Lindsay. All right. The story continues there. Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. Now to the major step to avert an economic disaster after a bill to avoid a rail strike was passed by the Senate and now heads to the president's desk. The bill enforces a contract between rail companies and 12 unions, despite several of those unions opposing the deal over the issue of guaranteed six days. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott. Tonight, the Senate moving to avert a potentially devastating economic disaster right before the holidays, passing a bill to avoid a crippling freight rail strike set for next week. The joint resolution is passed. In an overwhelming bipartisan vote, Congress forcing workers to accept a tentative agreement President Biden helped negotiate months ago. What was negotiated was so much better than anything they ever had. That deal includes a $16,000 immediate payout with an increase in wages and benefits to $160,000, a 24% pay raise, 
$5,000 performance bonuses, maintain access to health care plans, and an additional day of paid personal leave. But not in the deal, guaranteed paid sick days, a sticking point for some unions. I think we're going to get it done, but not within this agreement. Not within this agreement. We're going to avoid the rail strike, keep the rails running, keep things moving, and I'm going to go back and we're going to get paid leave, not just for rail workers, but for all workers. The House already passed a bill guaranteeing seven paid sick days to rail workers. That failed today in the Senate. Uh, who knows what One Democrat, Senator Joe Manchin, voted against it. But it did have surprising support from six conservative Republicans. Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, Lindsey Graham, Mike Braun, and John Kennedy, who earlier this year opposed the bill to make paid family and medical leave available to all Americans nationwide. Mr. Kennedy, aye. Mr. Cruz, aye. It's the first time in decades that Congress has used its powers to intervene and stop a strike. So one legitimate question is being asked now, are we about to do something where Congress will forever be settling the disputes through congressional action? I think that's a bad precedent and something that resonates with me. The rare move hasn't been used in 20 years. Jacob Forsgren, that track welder from Lincoln, Nebraska, disappointed that Congress had to step in in the first place. I should not have to go three and a half years without a raise uh, to, to see this process through. It... Uh, I, I think the railroads need to do a better job of, of actually bargaining in good faith. Um, so I, I, I guess to sum it all up, it's, it's an incredibly frustrating process. We can understand those frustrations. Certainly, Rachel Scott joins us now from Washington. Rachel, how is President Biden reacting to the bill's passage, and, and when does he plan to sign it? Well, Lindsay, the president tonight is celebrating the bipartisan action taken by Congress, saying that it pulled the economy back from the brink of a devastating shutdown that would have hurt millions of Americans. He wanted this deal done by the end of the weekend, and tonight he is promising to sign it as soon as it reaches his desk, Lindsay. All right, Rachel Scott reporting from the Capitol for us. Thanks so much, Rachel. Staying in Washington now, where today President Biden welcomed French President Macron to the White House for the first state visit of Biden's administration. Both leaders reaffirmed their commitment to support Ukraine, and President Biden was asked if he would talk to Vladimir Putin to help end the war. Take a listen. I'm prepared to speak with Mr. Putin if, in fact, there is an interest in him deciding he's looking for a way to end the war. He hasn't done that yet. If that's the case, in consultation with my French and my NATO friends, I'll be happy to sit down with Putin to see what he wants, has in mind. And now let's bring in our senior White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. Mary, you were there in the room. Give us a sense of the message that the president was sending. Well, the president is making it clear he has no plans to meet with Putin as of now, but he certainly isn't closing the door here. What he is doing, though, is sending a message to Vladimir Putin about the parameters, saying that he will only engage directly if Putin shows he is serious about ending the war in Ukraine, which so far he certainly has shown he has not. Now, the French president is taking a different approach. Macron has said he plans to speak with Putin in the coming days, but both Macron and Biden have been very firm that it is up to Ukraine to determine and decide when to negotiate and when they do. When they decide it is that time, Biden says they will have the full backing of NATO allies. Lindsay. All right. Mary Bruce from the White House. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you. We turn now to the medical emergency at a Los Angeles middle school where at least 10 students were involved in potentially ingesting drugs. Seven were rushed to the hospital. All the students were between 12 and 15 years old. We have the very latest on what authorities believe might have been the cause. Here's ABC's chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman. Tonight, dozens of L.A. firefighters responded to that scare at a middle school. Rescue 71, overdose 54, 35 S. That initial call for possible overdose is coming at 1034 a.m. with at least four victims from Van Nuys Middle School. That number growing to at least 10. All of the students experiencing mild to moderate symptoms. The massive response coming just a day after L.A. County reporting a nearly 1,300 percent increase in fentanyl deaths since 2016. It was possibly an edible cannabis. Uh, it was not fentanyl. It wasn't anything that at this point is life-threatening, but we do not conclusively have that answer. The victims between the ages of 12 and 15, medical personnel wheeling this student out on a stretcher into a waiting ambulance. Seven transported to area hospitals and concerned parents waiting nervously, others trying to take their kids home. One parent who just pulled her daughter from that middle school, telling us her child was offered drugs by another student while she was there. 
We asked her about her reaction to the news that 10 students may have suffered possible overdoses. Were you surprised? I am not surprised. It's devastating, but I'm not surprised. And Lindsay, even though all of the children are expected to recover, police here tell me there will be an investigation. And first responders told me that they are now imploring parents to remind their children that chemicals come in all forms, vape, lollipops, gummy bears, and often even the people who are offering it don't know what's inside. Lindsay. Yes, yeah, so often can look like candy, Matt. Thank you. Now to the arrest warrant issued for former NFL star Antonio Brown. He's accused of domestic battery for allegedly threatening to shoot the mother of his four children. ABC's Victor Akendo has the details. Tonight, former NFL superstar Antonio Brown wanted by Tampa police after an alleged domestic battery incident with a woman. Earlier today, police positioning themselves outside his home, even using a megaphone, urging him to come outside but police say they were unsure if he was home. According to authorities, Brown was arguing with a woman inside a South Tampa home on Monday, turning physical when he threw a shoe at her, a court issuing a warrant for his arrest. Brown has a long history of troubling behavior on and off the field, including being accused by two women of sexual assault. He's denied the allegations. And it's been almost a year since Brown played in the NFL last seen tossing his undershirt into the stands, running off the field shirtless, quitting mid-game. His contract with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers terminated days later. Our thanks to Victor for that. Now to a close call for two Navy warships in San Diego Bay. The smaller ship, a destroyer, entered the narrowest part of the harbor and appeared to be on a collision course with a ship that was already there. Tonight, the Navy is investigating why this happened. Our chief global affairs anchor, Martha Ranitz, reports. It is one of the narrowest points in San Diego Bay and one of the narrowest near misses in recent memory. This video showing the massive ships on a clear collision course. The larger amphibious ship, Harper's Ferry, exiting the port with the smaller guided missile destroyer, Momsen, entering the port, facing head on into the larger ship. The Navy vessels coming within just 35 yards of one another. Warship 49, we are coming to port to avoid you. Warship 92, we are coming to port to avoid you as well. That means both ships had to veer left to avoid a collision. According to inland navigation rules, vessels approaching one another would normally be required to stay to the right and pass one another on the left. Maneuvering ships this large is actually hard when they're slow because it takes a long time for any rudder input to take effect. And so you can see this collision nearly happening. Fortunately, no one was injured there. Martha Raniz joins us now. And Martha, I imagine there will still be a full investigation. Uh, there sure will be, Lindsay. The Navy says the sailors responded well to the impending collision, but this could have been a disaster. Aside from possible injury or damage to the ship, it could have shut down one of the busiest ports in the country right before Christmas. Mm. Lindsay? That's the last thing that we needed. Martha, our thanks to you. Next to the investigation into the brutal murders of four students at the University of Idaho and the frustration over mixed messages in the case and who police are looking for. ABC's Kana Whitworth is in Idaho with the latest. Tonight, police investigating the murders of four college students in Idaho trying to set the record straight after a string of mixed messages. In his first sit-down interview on the case, police chief James Fry telling us he still believes this was a targeted attack without revealing why. When you do say targeted, just to make it clear, are you referring to a person or people, not the house? This is a full investigation. We're looking at every piece of that investigation. But the chief refusing to say whether he believes the house or an individual was targeted. I believe in your ability to be a light in the dark. Overnight, the families of the victims joining the community for a vigil at the University of Idaho. The father of Kaylee Gonsalves saying his daughter and Maddie Mogan, her best friend since sixth grade, left this world together. They came here together. They eventually get into the same apartment together. And in the end, they died together in the same room, in the same bed. Ethan's mother telling the families gathered to make the most of their time together. Make sure that you spend as much time as possible with those people because time is precious and it's something you can't get back. Nearly three weeks after the murder, investigators still have no suspect. The community 
and the family members really want some assurances from you. What I can offer is that we are going to work continuously and we're going to provide as many answers as we can. And Lindsay, it's hard to imagine with this case in its third week, there is serious fear and concern in the community of Moscow that this case might not actually get solved despite the chief saying he will not allow it to go cold. Lindsay? Cannot imagine that going without any resolution. Kana, thank you. Tonight, there's a major new storm slamming the West. 23 states are on high alert for heavy snow, rain, and high winds. A system will then move across the country. All this comes after that deadly tornado outbreak. Our senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all. Hey, Rob. Hey, Lindsay, you know, this is a very powerful storm for December 1st that's slamming the rest right now, the west, excuse me, and they're going to be piling the snow up in the way of feet. We've got avalanche warnings now up for parts of California all the way through Colorado. Winter storm warnings as well. Take a look, a lot of pink on the map there and a lot of wind energy with this. In the mountains, I think we'll see 65, 70 mile per hour winds and some of that will pour in through the heartland with wind uh, watches and advisories up in through uh, St. Louis and central Indiana. All right, the rains tonight uh, in through central California will be pushing down to the south over the next several hours. And I think it'll be hanging around Los Angeles and San Diego tomorrow. So fire season at least is over, but one to three feet of snow expected in the Sierras on top of what they've already seen. That's building a nice base, but again, an avalanche problems in through the uh, Wasatch and the Colorado Rockies as well. Through the plains, it's kind of dry, then hits the Mississippi, picks up a little bit more moisture, and then we'll, for the rain to pick up Friday night into Saturday morning from Cincinnati over the Appalachians and through D.C. I-95 getting very wet throughout the late morning hours on Saturday and then eventually pushing out this one. The good news with this storm, although it's pretty powerful, Lindsay, not much in the way of severe weather and it's moving pretty quick. Lindsay. All right, Rob Marciano for us. Thanks so much, Rob. Now to your money. You may have noticed that gas prices have started to drop finally. And if you're trying to spend wisely on holiday gifts, what scams do you need to be on the lookout for? Our business correspondent Alexis Christophorus is here now with a whole hodgepodge of things. We're like all things money, Alexis. We right. are. We so are. Just like rapid fire with you. Let's start with the gas prices, <laughs> okay. lowest since they've been since February. Yeah. Why and how long can we expect them to stay? Yeah, now gas prices are back to where they were before Russia invaded Ukraine. Some are saying we could see gas fall below $3 a gallon in parts of the country by Christmas. So this is putting real money back into people's pockets. A few reasons for this. One is we're not driving as much because the busy summer driving season is behind us. We also have COVID lockdowns in China, which means that country is not uh, consuming as much oil as they normally would. And lots of refineries here that were offline because of maintenance and repairs are back up to speed. Before we get too excited about these low prices, we know that geopolitical events, economic events can turn this all upside down. Next week, OPEC plus members are going to be meeting. If they decide to cut production, that can move prices up. Also, the U.S. and Europe are negotiating a price cap on Russian oil. Depending on how that plays out and whether or not Russia uh, retaliates, that could also move prices up. Online scams are at an all-time high. What can we do to protect ourselves? It is the season for these yeah. scammers to steal our information. So you have to remain vigilant. Social media is a gold mine for them. So be careful of any uh, social media ads or targeted email ads, text ads, pushing you to click on a link. You want to make sure this is a reputable company. Also, look out for misspellings and poor grammar in a website mm -hmm. um, address. That's a sure tell sign that that is definitely a fake. Also, retailers and banks this year, um, they are never going to ask you to pay in a different way. What we're seeing this year is a lot of these retailers are sending out fake emails saying, your purchase didn't go through. Now you need to pay us with Venmo or Zelle. Don't do it. If you have a question about your purchase, go directly to the retailer. Also, try to use a credit card whenever possible. It offers better fraud protection than a debit card or certainly a gift card. And that old adage, if it, if it sounds too good to mm -hmm. be true, you know, it probably is. For those who are shopping online, a lot of people are doing that. How do we make our information a little little less vulnerable because, yeah. you know, we are giving all of our credit card information and absolutely billing, mailing address, all of that. It took me a long time to convert and start to really right. buy things <laughs> online. So this is a personal favorite of mine. When you go to check out and they ask you to create an account or check out as a guest whenever possible, check out as a guest. When you create an account, you're keeping all your personal info, including uh -huh. your credit card on that retailer or that store's server. If they get hacked, your information could be could be compromised. Also, if you go on a site and they ask you to accept their 
cookies. That's a way for them to track your data and collect your data. These are little small files that live on a web browser. You can reject those so-called cookies and continue on the site, and that's what I always try to do. I always check out as a guest just because I can never remember my password for any <laughs> Whatever the any reason, account. that's right. good. Um, and, and lastly, there's a new government report that suggests that our spending actually was higher than income in yeah. October. What do you make of that? Well, you never want to spend more than you, yeah. you're bringing in, so that is a little bit of a, a worrisome sign. Look, despite high inflation and higher interest rates, consumers continue to spend. We're noticing some cracks, though. More people are using credit cards. They're dipping into their savings now, that savings cushion we all built up during the pandemic. These are things you don't want to be doing. Household debt is now growing at its fastest pace in oh. 15 years. If a recession definitely happened, if a recession were to happen next year, you want to have a cushion. Remember, pay yourself first and try to save a little each month, even if it is just a few dollars. Alexis Christophorus, all things money, savings, <laughs> uh, we so appreciate it. My pleasure. When we come back, video shows the terrifying moments a base jumper slams into the slide of a cliff and gets stuck on the rocks. In this week's TikTok, beauty guru Manny MUA tells us how he's created a community of millions of followers simply by being himself. It was once one of the biggest cryptocurrency exchanges and its CEO was viewed as the industry's ultimate success story. Now the company's filing for bankruptcy and he's lost billions of dollars. Our George Stephanopoulos talks to former CEO Sam Bankman Freed in his first network interview. This is ABC News Live. The crushing the families here in Poland. At refugee centers in Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom, boom, boom. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's Bring how you start your, your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Next week, even Santa's gonna love this. Two GMA holiday concerts. Tuesday, Darlene Love and Chris Ruggiero live. Then Friday, Backstreet's back all right. It's the Backstreet Boys live with Christmas in New York on GMA. Sponsored by CarMax. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen, wherever you get your podcasts. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest story. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. Here's to everything ahead.
Just incredible video here. It shows a base jumper appearing to lose control of his parachute in Utah. He slams into the side of a cliff, getting his parachute trapped on the rocks. He ended up dangling about 70 feet above the ground for two hours until rescue teams arrived to get him down. He was badly injured and had to be airlifted to a hospital. Next to the first network interview with Sam Bankman Free, the founder of FTX, about the collapse of that cryptocurrency exchange, George Stephanopoulos recently flew to the Bahamas, where the exchange was based to link with Freed and brings us their conversation about what happened. A lot of people look at you and see Bernie Madoff. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that's who I am at, at all, but I understand why they're saying that. People lost money, and people lost a lot of money. and. I mean, at the end of the day, look, there's a question of what happened and why and who did what, um, what caused the, the meltdown. And I think that is, reads very differently, right? When you, when you look at the classic Bernie Madoff story, there was no real business there. The whole thing, as I understand it, I think, was, was just one, one big Ponzi scheme, right? FTX, that was a real business. He was at the top of the cryptocurrency world. 30-year-old billionaire Sam Bankman Freed. You just need FTX. It's FTX. It's a safe and easy way to get into crypto. Yeah, I don't think so. Super Bowl ads. Yep. Naming yep. stadiums. Super Steph Bowl Curry. Stadium. Giselle Bunchen. We did a lot of things to try to uh, to try and bolster our reputation, to try and you know help our brand. But in the early morning hours of November 11th, it all came to an end when FTX filed for bankruptcy and Bankman Freed stepped down as CEO amid reports of FTX customer funds being used to pay Alameda Research creditors. This confirmed by former Alameda CEO Carolyn Ellison during an early November video meeting with employees. Alameda, the crypto trading firm also founded by Bankman Freed. ABC News reached out to Carolyn Ellison for comment, but has not heard back. One yeah. of the reasons FTX went bankrupt is because FTX deposits yep. were used to pay Alameda's creditors. Carolyn Ellison said you knew about that. Is that true? You know, best I can tell, uh, Alameda did have a big position open on, on FTX. Um, that position, uh, I think, was, you know, very over collateralized uh, a year ago. There was a, a total market collapse and, sp you know, specifically a large correlated collapse in its assets, you know, over the last month and to some extent over the last year that I, uh, you know, threatened that position quite a bit. And I think that's, you know, as best I understand, a lot of what happened there. I, I am no cryptocurrency expert. I'm no finance expert, yep. but I don't think you answered my question. I was asking, yep. did you know that FTX deposits were used to pay off Alameda creditors? Uh, I don't know of FTX deposits being used to pay off Alameda creditors. Are you, uh, which, which creditors are you referring to? Carolyn Ellison said that you all knew that these funds were used, were put into Alameda. They were the funds owned by your depositors. So I can't speak for who knew what. You know, a lot of the customers on FTX did have, you know, borrowers either, you know, in dollars or Bitcoin or, or euros. But as you know, the FTX terms of service yep. tell the people who signed up, none of the digital assets in your account are the property of or shall be or may be loaned to FTX trading. But you're saying that happened. My understanding is a few things happened. The first is there is a margin trading facility on FTX by which users can lend out funds, by which other users borrow funds. And so there are explicit cases where there is, you know, margin extended, where there is borrow lending. If yep. Alameda is borrowing the money that belongs yep. to FTX depositors, that's a bright red line, isn't it? There are a lot of cases where that's actually explicitly part of the programs and that are but happening. Not, not and here. Here it me. says that the digital assets may not be loaned to FTX trading. They can't be loaned out. They can't be loaned. I... Uh, there existed a borrow lending facility on FTX. And, and I think that's probably covered, I, I don't remember exactly where, but somewhere else in the terms of service. But they'd have to approve of that. They're saying they didn't approve of it here. They're so saying you approved of it. If you rewind to, you know, the beginning of FTX, um, where 
you know, some customers were, you know, uh, I think in line with sort of existing relationships that, that they've had, at least in some cases, wiring money straight to Alameda Research in order to trade on FTX. So on you FTX. do know and you did know that FTX deposits were being funneled to Alameda? So I was vaguely aware that that was how some wires were being sent in the first place. Um, Didn't that set off alarm bells in your head? So there are a lot of people who are involved in that process. And look, I really deeply wish that I had taken like a lot more responsibility for understanding what the details were of what was going on there. I knew that legal was involved. I knew that other groups at the company were involved, that you know, there were agreements drafted up. But you're ultimately responsible. I and mean, ultimately, absolutely, like I look, I should have been on top of this. And I feel really, really bad and regretful that I wasn't. And a lot of people got hurt. And that, that's on me. Here's what Mark Cuban has to say about that. Yep. He said, if I were him, I'd be afraid of going to jail for a long time. At the end of the day, you know, it's not my call what happens. And uh, the world will judge me as it will. Are you worried about going to jail? There are a lot of things that are worrying me right now. Um, and, you know, as best as possible, I'm trying to focus on what I can do going forward to be helpful and, you know, let whatever, you know, regulatory and legal processes are happening play out as they will. I, I do want to move on, but just, just finally on yep. this. This is really a yes or no question. Yep. Carolyn Ellison says you knew that FTX funds were being funnel to Alameda. Did you know that? I knew that there is an open margin position there and that that involved I know, but that's not what I'm borrow. asking. <laughs> if she's in court and you're in court and she's under oath and you're under yep. oath and you're asked, did you know that these funds were being funneled to Alameda, what is your answer? I did not know that there is any improper uh, use of customer funds. You also took out a $1 billion loan. What was that for? That was generally for reinvesting in the company. That was not for, you know, consumption. I, you know, to my knowledge, I have basically nothing left. Um, you know, basically everything I had was invested in the business. I expect I'm going to have nothing at the end of this. I, I think I had $100,000 left in my bank account last I checked, and I, I think I have, you know, uh, one credit card working with that right now. Earlier this summer, you thought you had, what, 32 billion? Probably 20, but uh, a whole lot more than I do now. I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's been a really, it's been a really humbling fall in, in a lot of ways. How do you explain the failure? Was it an inattention, arrogance? Um, it's a good question. Was it unethical? Some part of it was just literal distraction. I sh really should have spent some time each day taking a step back and saying, what are the most important things here, right? And like, how do I have oversight of those and make sure that I'm not losing track of those? And frankly, I did a pretty incomplete job at that. I spent a lot less time looking at assets and looking at balances and positions because that's not where revenue came from. And so it, I wasn't seen as a core business driver. Obviously, it was a core risk, and that was a huge mistake of mine to not think more about that. Now you said one of your great it's, talents in a podcast was managing risk. That's right. And well, it's obviously wrong. Well, I, it's, I think that there is something maybe even deeper wrong there, which was I wasn't even trying. Like, I wasn't spending any time or effort trying to manage risk on FTX, trying, like, and that, that obviously, that's, that's a stunning a admission. What? That's a pretty stunning admission. Yeah, I mean, it, I don't know what to say. Like, what happened, happened. And like, if I had been, if I had been spending an hour a day thinking about risk management on FTX, I don't think that would have happened. I think I, I stopped working as hard for a bit. You know, honestly, if I look back on myself, I think I got a little cocky. I made more than a little bit. Um, and I think part of me, like, you know, felt like, um, like we'd made it. 
tomorrow, George will bring us more of that interview. The one hour special, Billions Missing Inside the FTX Collapse, debuts at 8 Eastern, 9 Pacific, tomorrow, right here on ABC News Live. Still ahead here on Prime, Beyonce's mother, Tina Knowles Lawson, helps us look back on the lives lost to the HIV AIDS epidemic. And we're also recognizing the strides made in the battle against that epidemic. And the desperate rush to save two people trapped inside a car. More men are leaving the workforce. We take a look at the rise in stay-at-home dads by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle released the trailer for their Netflix documentary series as Prince William and Princess Kate visit the U.S. More on their trip coming up. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like Your health, your money. Breaking news, exclusives. Pop culture and with the biggest stars. Music, trends, style. And some laughs. And some good food. You got me feeling like You know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons, for everything you need to know. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. Oh, 200. 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back, everyone. A new analysis of data shows that more American men are staying out of the workforce to take care of children. Let's take a look by the numbers. According to a Bloomberg report, 88.5% of prime working age men between 25 to 54 were either working or looking for work last month based on Bureau of Labor Statistics data. That's down from 91% in 1995 at a peak in 1955 of 97.6% of prime working age men in or looking to join the workforce. Men leaving the workforce for caregiving responsibilities has grown in that time with census data showing that men accounted for 5% of the one-fifth of U.S. families with a stay-at-home parent. That's up from about 1% in the mid-90s. But government data may actually underestimate the trend, as other surveys show a more significant change when using wider categories. Pew Research Center surveys found 2.1 million stay-at-home dads by 2021, which is equal to about 18% of all stay-at-home parents and up from 10% in 1989. Pew also found that 23% of men out of the workforce said that they left to care for children compared to 13% for job loss, 34% for disability, and 20% for being in school or retirement. 
fired. And of course, the disruptions of the pandemic changed divisions of labor in many American homes, even when both parents are working. In 2021, men average 1.91 hours a day caring for household members, according to Bureau of Labor Statistics data. That's up from 1.62 hours in 2019, but that is still below the 2.39 hours that women spend a day on average caring for family. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. How would you like an implant inside your brain? The details behind Elon Musk's latest venture. And a fossil reveals a look at a newly discovered dinosaur species. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. much happening these days it's hard to keep up things change hour by hour minute by minute the historic weather that's now unfolding the worries on wall street we're bringing you the right now at a nationwide teacher shortage the right now look at the day ahead an alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories world news now and america this morning america's number one early morning news today does feel a little different early mornings on abc news live it's lunchtime in America. So, what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like your health, your money, breaking news, exclusives, pop culture, and with the biggest stars, music, trends, style, and some laughs, and some good food. You got me feeling like you know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons, for everything you need to know. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're today. making magic. Next week, even Santa's gonna love this. Two GMA holiday concerts. Tuesday, Darlene Love and Chris Ruggiero live. Then Friday, Backstreet's back all right. It's the Backstreet Boys live with Christmas in New York on GMA. Sponsored by CarMax. Now streaming on ABC News Live. 2020, true crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Facing the threat of a potentially crippling rail worker strike. The joint resolution is passed. The Senate voted on legislation Thursday to keep the rails up and running. With the economy hanging in the balance, the White House called on Congress to step in. A rail work stoppage could cost the economy $2 billion a day based on some expert estimates, as well as potentially raise inflation and upend travel for 7 million commuters. Congress used its constitutional authority to intervene. The House pushing forward two bills Wednesday. One compels workers to accept a tentative deal the White House helped broker earlier this year. The other calls for seven days of paid sick leave for rail workers, which narrowly passed with three Republicans supporting it. Two separate incidents involving children and possible drug use are under investigation in California. In Sherman Oaks, officials were looking into suspected overdoses in 10 students between 12 and 14 years old from Van Nuys Middle School. Seven of them were taken to the hospital. Officials have not confirmed what substances may have been involved. Meanwhile, in San Francisco, a 10-month-old hospitalized after apparently ingesting fentanyl at Moscone Park. The parents say the toddler was given Narcan to reverse opioid overdoses and survive. Police and firefighters will only say they did respond but are investigating the cause of the medical emergency. For now, the city will close the park at night and police patrols will increase around that park. 
police in Reno, Nevada released video of a dramatic rescue from a ravine. Officers can be seen running down the ravine towards the overturned vehicle and then into the water, eventually pulling the occupants out of the vehicle. Officials said that the responding officers witnessed the crash and jumped into the water to help, despite extremely cold temperatures. Elon Musk's brain implant startup may soon be ready for humans. Speaking at an event for his company, Neuralink, Musk said he believed the technology would be ready for human testing in six months. Neuralink is designing a brain implant that it says could help restore vision, even to people born blind, as well as help people with spinal injuries regain full use of their bodies. The company had been conducting animal testing, and Musk said it's still working through the FDA approval process. Prince William and Princess Kate are continuing their visit to Boston. The Prince and Princess of Wales have taken part in a series of visits in their first U.S. trip in eight years, including visiting the climate technology startup incubator, Greentown Labs. The royal family still dealing with backlash stemming from allegations of racism against a member of the royal household, with nonprofit founder Ngozi Falani speaking out about her experience. I'm very clear that I experienced racism in an environment that I should have felt safe in, and we need to address that. Scientists have discovered fossils of a new predatory dinosaur species. The near-complete skeleton was found in Mongolia and named Natovenator polydontis, which translates to swimming hunter with many teeth, as the dinosaur was likely a semi-aquatic diving predator, according to a new paper. Researchers found the fossils in 2008, collecting 196 catalog specimens whereupon further study, a skeleton came to light of the bird-like creature. Researchers said it was the first time a non-avian dinosaur was found with a streamlined body similar to those of some birds. Welcome back. December marks the start of HIV AIDS Awareness Month, a time to look at the strides we've made in the battle against the epidemic and how far we still have to go. From medical advancements to clear education to honest, open, and compassionate conversation, ABC News Live is taking us down the 40-year path of progress in a new special, Viral, A World Without AIDS. Johnny was my best friend growing up. Johnny was a light. Johnny was the funniest person in the whole world. Miss Tina Knowles Lawson, mom to one of the world's most famous women, Beyonce. That's her Uncle Johnny to the right. Miss Tina is transported back in time, remembering her nephew Johnny. But the two were close in age, almost like siblings, finding a common bond in their love for fashion. We were designers, we were hairstylists, we were makeup artists. We just had a ball together. He just, he made me laugh more than anybody else that I've ever seen in my life. I found out that Johnny had AIDS through him being hospitalized. And I went to see him, we had no uh, forewarning. That diagnosis, devastating to the entire family who considered Johnny their centerpiece. I want to dedicate this award to my Uncle Johnny, the most fabulous gay man I've ever known, I ever knew. I told him that, you know, that he would never be alone and that everybody would be there with them. Because at the time, the, you know, when people were diagnosed, they died people you'd see on the street who'd be there one day and gone the next. That was what we were facing throughout the 1990s. Damon Jones was in his early 20s, living in San Francisco at the height of the epidemic. He watched his friends disappear. Give us a sense of your friends and your loved ones who you lost to the AIDS epidemic. One of my best friends in the world was named John. We lived together for five years. He was like a brother to me, and he was only 30 years old and he was gone a week later. While most associated AIDS with a virus transmitted by men having sex with other men, it quickly became clear HIV could strike anyone. AIDS has made the headlines again. The great American tennis player Arthur Ashe made it clear here in New York today that he very much would have preferred to keep it a private matter. I remember walking into my first year med school lecture hall and everybody was pouring over the newspaper and it was the news of Magic Johnson having HIV. I will have to retire from the Lakers. 
Dr. Rochelle Walensky, now CDC director, back then was fresh out of medical school, part of the community rushing to understand HIV AIDS, but advancements weren't coming fast enough. What was it like as a physician not having anything you could give them to save them? What you could do was you could give them grace, you could give them comfort, you could give them pride. Were there moments in that battle that stay with you to this day? Once patients, families recognize that they might be gay, that they might be gay and have HIV, many patients did not, have, you know, their families abandoned them. And, um, you know, holding someone's hand. Holding someone's hand when their family is not there. Is not there. I mean, people were afraid to be in a room with somebody, and it was just a lot of misinformation. It was a lot of judgment. It was a lot of hatred and very little compassion from some people for these people who were actually amazing human beings that were suffering and dying. The virus targets the immune system, killing by attacking a type of white blood cell, making it hard for someone to fight infections and disease. The virus presents itself in blood, breast milk, semen, vaginal fluids, and can be transmitted when those bodily fluids from an infected person are shared. Since the start of the epidemic, 84.2 million people have become infected with HIV globally, and more than 40 million people have died from AIDS-related illnesses. To lose someone and to witness them decompensate so close up, to lose their physical and mental faculties, was traumatizing. Six years after the first reported AIDS cases in the U.S., the first step forward came in 1987 with the approval of the drug AZT, inhibiting the HIV virus from replicating, a glimmer of hope. All of a sudden, patients who you could say, we don't have anything for you, and you would hold their hands as they were passing, the same kind of patient you could say, you might live with this. You can watch our full ABC News Live special, Viral, A World Without AIDS, co-anchored by our Juju Chang and Alex Perez, right after Prime at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. It will also be available to stream tomorrow on Hulu. We turn now to our weekly segment, TikTok, where we take a closer look at the story behind the sensation. Our next guest is breaking the gender stigma in the beauty industry one palette at a time, proving that makeup can be for everyone. Manny Gutierrez, known to his fans as Manny MUA, has become a pillar in the industry, celebrating the beauty of gender fluidity. He was the first male face on Maybelline in 2017, as has cultivated an inclusive community of individuals online who are now redefining the standards of beauty and joining us now, Mr. Manny MUA himself. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Manny. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. We appreciate you being here. Manny, walk us through uh, how you've evolved uh, into this, this beauty guru. You know, it's been the craziest experience because when I started online, I didn't know I was going to be like a beauty guru. I didn't know I was going to be you know, have so many followers and things like that, and people would look up to me. I just really was trying to find a community that I felt like I could be myself. Um, and I think that's kind of where it started. I was just being authentically me, and I think a lot of people gravitate towards people who just are themselves, who want to express themselves the way that they want to. And so it just kind of transformed into what it is today based off of, you know, this need for wanting to have a community for myself. And that authenticity, I think you're right. I think that that can be really magnetic. In recent years, uh, we've seen more male makeup influencers and celebrities who really tapped into wearing makeup. Do you think there's still a stigma around men and, and makeup? Um, I think that there is a little bit, but I think that it just goes away more and more and more every single year because I think at the end of the day, a lot of people, when they see something that they're not used to, they fear it, right? Or things that they're not... They don't see all, all the time. So I think that if you're constantly, you know, putting things in people's faces of like, this is who we are, this is what I want to do, this is my expression of who I am as a person, I think that with more of that, it becomes more acceptance because people are able to see it and it's like, oh, it's not scary. It's not bad. It's just their form of expression in the way that they want to. And I think that that's really, really important to just constantly have people in the media and showing off what they want to do with whatever expression they want to 
be perceived as. You also star in the reboot of the early 2000 classic reality show, The Surreal Life. Uh, you were only 12 years old when the first season aired. How did this opportunity <laughs> come about? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I got the email from my team and she's like, you know, they're looking for a digital talent to go on the show because like, you know, obviously the show is about bringing so many different walks of life together and they didn't have, I guess, a digital talent on there and especially a men, a man in makeup and a beauty guru. Like it was just, I think I had clicked so many checks for them that they were like, oh my God, this is something different. Like a, it's a digital creator who grew up all in a very conservative house, grew up Mormon, you know, now is a beauty guru. Uh, uh, wears makeup, keeps his beard though. Right. So it's, there was a lot of things that were a little bit different from my perspective from the rest of the cast. So they're like, oh, like this is, you know, something that could be very unique in the situation where you're bringing different walks of life together. And you're also the founder and CEO of Lunar Beauty, a cosmetic line designed for everyone. And what was the full circle moment for you going from being a cosmetic store employee to now founding and formulating your own makeup line? I find that so impressive. Thank you so much. And do you know what's crazy is that like my full circle moment was I started my beauty journey working at a Sephora and to have my brand when I had launched it, I think two years later, I had actually gone into Sephora. My brand made it into Sephora and was there for a year. So it was like this insane full circle moment for me that in six years, I went from working at a Sephora to having a brand in Sephora. So it was very like that was such an aha full circle moment for me that I felt like truly I had worked so hard to create something that I truly loved and I truly believed in and you know with Lunar Beauty it's my baby you know I'm a reviewer I I do make it for a living and when people buy my products I want them to know that I gave it my all and let's end with a quick rap rapid fire game of yay or nay makeup edition all right <laughs> okay. sleeping with a full face of makeup yay or nay nay using a dry beauty blender nay lip liner yay i thought you would say that based on on your answer before boldly painted eyebrows what was it boldly, boldly painted boldly painted eyebrows i'm gonna say a neither nay or or yay i think it's whatever you want on the brow if you want it to be bold be bold if you want it to be more simple be simple Whatever fits your face. Manny, thank you so much for joining our series this week. And you can learn more helpful beauty and makeup tips by watching his videos under the TikTok handle at Manny, M-U-A-773. And new episodes of The Surreal Life air on Monday on VH1. Thanks so much, Manny. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Have a good one. You too. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. Take a look. That is Billy Porter laying across the Hollywood Walk of Fame star with his name on it. What's particularly poignant about this moment is that, of course, it does happen to uh, be World AIDS Day. As we know, Billy Porter recently revealed that he had been living with HIV for 14 years and had been hesitant to speak out for fear of how his mother would react. Porter now says that he was proud to be a modern representation of what being black, queer, and HIV positive looks like. As you may recall, back in 2019, he won a primetime Emmy for Outstanding Lead Actor, becoming the first openly gay black man to win in any leading acting category. That's just one of the many reasons that he got his star. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Hour monitoring a few things. A major update on the Biden push to lower the crushing student loan debt faced by so many. And with President Biden set to do his first state dinner with French President Emmanuel Macron, our George Stephanopoulos sits down with him one on one. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there?
Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Friday, 2020 True Crime. A 15-year-old girl taken by a 50-year-old man. No one could believe it. Do you think he preyed on you? He did. And he manipulated me. Friday night, exclusive new interviews with those closest to the case. He did, at one point, blame the devil. And the stunning police interview never before seen. 2020. That explosive secret was about to be revealed. Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. It's lunchtime in America. So, what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like... Your health, your money. Breaking news, exclusives. Pop culture, and with the biggest stars. Music, trends, style. And some laughs. And some good food. You got me feeling like... You know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons, for everything you need to know. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. President Biden's sweeping college forgiveness plan is now in the hands of the Supreme Court. The administration had asked justices to overturn a lower court ruling that had put the program on hold after several red states objected to the plan. The court did not overturn the ruling, but agreed to rule on the program's legality with expedited oral arguments in February. A longtime associate of Florida Congressman Matt Gates has been sentenced to 11 years in prison. Joel Greenberg pled guilty to six federal charges, including wire fraud and sex trafficking a minor. Greenberg agreed to cooperate with the investigation into Congressman Gates, which includes allegations of him having sex with a minor. Gates has insisted he has done nothing wrong. Multiple sources told ABC News that that investigation had stalled. Legendary Hall of Fame pitcher Gaylord Perry has died. Perry was a two-time Cy Young Award winner and the first pitcher to win the award in both leagues. He was a proud master of the spitball caught only once in his career. He pitched for eight teams over the course of 22 years. Gaylord Perry was 84. Now to the major step to avert an economic disaster after a bill to avoid a rail strike was passed by the Senate and now heads to the president's desk. The bill enforces a contract between rail companies and 12 unions, despite several of those unions opposing the deal over the issue of guaranteed sick days. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott. Tonight, the Senate moving to avert a potentially devastating economic disaster right before the holidays, passing a bill to avoid a crippling freight rail strike set for next week. The joint resolution is passed. In an overwhelming bipartisan vote, Congress forcing workers to accept a tentative agreement President Biden helped negotiate months ago. What was negotiated was so much better than anything they ever had. That deal includes a $16,000 immediate payout with an increase in wages and benefits to $160,000, a 24% pay raise, $5,000 performance bonuses, maintain access to health care plans, and an additional day of paid personal leave. But not in the deal, guaranteed paid sick days, a sticking point for some unions. I think we're going to get it done, but not within this agreement. Not within this agreement. We're going to avoid the rail strike, keep the rails running, keep things moving, and I'm going to go back and we're going to get paid leave, not just for rail workers, but for all workers. The House already passed a bill guaranteeing seven paid sick days to rail workers. That failed today in the Senate. Uh, who knows what One Democrat, Senator Joe Manchin, voted against it, but it did have surprising support from six conservative Republicans. Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, Lindsey Graham, Mike Braun, and John Kennedy who earlier this year opposed the bill to make paid family and medical leave available to all Americans nationwide. Mr. Kennedy, aye. Mr. Cruz, aye. It's the first time in decades that Congress has used its powers to intervene and stop a strike. So one legitimate question is being asked now, are we about to do something where Congress will forever be settling the disputes through congressional action? I think that's a bad precedent and something that resonates with me. The rare move hasn't been used in 20 years. Jacob Forsgren, that track welder from Lincoln, Nebraska, disappointed that Congress had to step in in the first place. I should not have to go three and a half years without a raise uh, to, to see this process through. It, uh, 
I, I think the railroads need to do a better job of, of actually bargaining in good faith. Um, so I, I, I guess to sum it all up, it's, it's an incredibly frustrating process. We can understand his frustration. Our thanks to Rachel for that. Now to the breaking news involving former President Trump. A federal appeals court has shut down the special master review of documents seized at Mar-a-Lago. So what does this mean for the former president and for investigators who have been waiting to get their hands on those documents? Let's get straight to our Chief Justice Correspondent, Mr. Pierre Thomas, who's in Washington tonight with more on this breaking news. So, Pierre, explain the significance of this ruling and what it means for the investigation of the former president. Lindsay, it's another rebuke of the federal judge overseeing Justice Department's Mar-a-Lago document investigation. An appeals court tonight ruling that there's no need for a special master to oversee any of those documents Trump took from the White House and to resolve issues of privilege. The appeals court concluding that Judge Aileen Cannon cited no legitimate case law and questioned whether f former President Trump should be treated any differently than any other criminal defendant. The appeals court had previously overturned a ruling by Judge Cannon blocking DOJ from using classified documents seized from Mar-a-Lago. The latest ruling means that DOJ could soon have unfettered access to all those documents taken in the search of Trump's property, Lindsay. All right. The story continues there. Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. Pleasure. Now to a close call for two Navy warships in San Diego Bay. They appear to be on a collision course, narrowly missing each other. The Navy is now investigating. ABC News Chief Global Affairs anchor Martha Raddatz reports. It is one of the narrowest points in San Diego Bay and one of the narrowest near misses in recent memory. This video showing the massive ships on a clear collision course. The larger amphibious ship, Harper's Ferry, exiting the port with the smaller guided missile destroyer, Momsen, entering the port, facing head on into the larger ship. The Navy vessels coming within just 35 yards of one another. Warship 4-9, we are coming to port to avoid you. Warship 9-2, we are coming to port to avoid you as well. That means both ships had to veer left to avoid a collision. According to inland navigation rules, vessels approaching one another would normally be required to stay to the right and pass one another on the left. Maneuvering ships this large is actually hard when they're slow because it takes a long time for any rudder input to take effect. And so you can see this collision nearly happening. Our thanks to Martha for that. President Biden today welcomed French President Emmanuel Macron to the White House for the first state visit of Biden's administration. Macron has been a key partner in Ukraine's fight against Russia, but Macron and Biden do not see eye to eye on everything. ABC's George Stephanopoulos sat down with Macron for this conversation. What exactly do you hope to accomplish this week? I hope I would say to resynchronize in a certain way and build new ambitions for the future. Have they been out of sync on this? I think so regarding some economic issues. Why? Because I think we're perfectly working closely together when, um, when we speak about war, when we speak about Ukraine, when we speak about geopolitics. But when you look at the situation after February this year, gas, energy prices are skyrocketing in Europe because we are Buyers and not police. Americans think they're skyrocketing here, too. <laughs> but the situation is very different. When you take oil, perhaps, but when I look at the gas prices paid by your companies and the European companies, this is absolutely not the same level. But on top of that, a series of decisions. I can completely understand and I do share the perspective of this decision. Chips Act, Inflation Reduction Act are perhaps very good for the US economy. But as they were not properly coordinated with the European economies, they create just the absence of level playing field. You're the first French president ever to have two state visits to the United States. Of course, the first one was under President Trump. He announced uh, two weeks ago that he's going to run for president again. What would it mean for the relationship between the US and France if Donald Trump became president again? First, I, I, I try not to make any type of um, Political fiction, as I am not... Political fiction? I'm not a commentator, I'm a player of, uh, of this party and... Uh, but you'll be president if he's re-elected president. I never speculate about future outcomes of elections in my country, so I will not do so for the others. <laughs> I'm very much engaged and, and my willingness is for the two years to come to deliver the maximum results with President Biden's administration. Let's talk about the war in Ukraine. 
Is Ukraine winning the war right now? Ukraine is clearly having a very positive counteroffensive. Saying they are winning the war is probably too early. How about Vladimir Putin? You, you said you expected to speak with him again. Do you know when you're going to speak with him? Yes. When? In the coming days, I wanted first to have the state visit and have an in-depth discussion with President Biden and our teams together. Do you have a vision of what a successful peace looks like? It's a sustainable one. What does that mean? It's the two parties to decide and uh, the rest of the international community to be here to guarantee and to protect. But what I, what I do believe um, is um, what I do believe in is that it's a good peace is not a peace which will be imposed to the Ukrainians by others, number one. A good peace is not a peace which will, be, which will n not be accepted on the mid to long run by one of the two parties. Is a man who's capable of making a decision like that capable of negotiating what you call a good peace? This is exactly the question. I know. What's the answer? If I had the answer, I would be around the negotiating table with him and somebody in charge. Is so he I still think, rational is the question? I do hope, I do believe in that. My conviction and my pragmatic uh, uh, approach is to say, I have to engage with the existing leaders and the one in charge of their country. Because if we do believe in national sovereignty, we, we cannot decide to say the precondition is a regime change to start negotiating. I think he made mistakes. Is it impossible to come back at the table and negotiate something? I think it's still possible. You've talked about a crisis of democracies yes. around the world. What does that mean? Look, I think all the Western democracies are under very strong pressure. We see the extremes raising. We clearly see in our societies a sort of fascination for authoritarianism. The big transformation of this past 10 to 15 years social networks. I can come with, from my Twitter account or post on my Facebook or Instagram account a very long message. I'm called Xelinot dot I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows who I am, but I have a very convincing narrative saying crazy things about a vaccine, a pandemic, the war, and I will bring together some piece of evidence with no link, no verification. The beginning of a doubt. Doubt is good, but when it is based on argumentation and we start on the same ground. Right now we're facing a situation where just in the last couple of days, Elon Musk has said he's going to relax all the content moderation policies, COVID misinformation back on Twitter. He's making it worse, isn't he? I think this is a big issue. I think it deserves to be largely engaged. What I push very much forward is exactly the opposite, more regulation. And regulation is not... Can you do that in France on Twitter? We did, and we are implementing it, and we did it at the European level. Free speech and democracy is based on respect and public order. We can, you can demonstrate, you can have free speech, you can write what you want, but there is um, responsibilities and limits. The limit is that you cannot go in the streets and have um, a racist speech or anti-Semitic speech. You cannot put at risk the life of somebody else. Violence is never legitimate in democracy. And this is, for me, what is very important to defend now. In democracy, you can change your leaders. You can change the one who, who will but represent you, you accept the change. and vote you. Yeah. And the point is, as long as you have these rules, you are not entitled to be violent. You decide the one. But you not go to the street you can go to the city to protest, to demonstrate through your words, but you have to accept, at a point of time, the rule of democracy. And when in one of the biggest democracies and the oldest democracies of this world, you can have leaders and supporters deciding on purpose to refuse the result, because this is the, the one they didn't want to see, this is just the beginning of the end of the democracy. And I think whatever you think, whatever your side could be, is just, uh, we, we have to protect the model where we stand. Because what is the alternative of this model? Perhaps it's not perfect, I, I do agree. Perhaps, especially when you belong to the minority where you lose an election, you are not happy with, with the outcome. I imagine that a lot of Democrats were not happy in 2016. Did they invade Capitol Hill? No. So my strong belief is that 
we have to stick to the rules because this institution and the democratic framework is much more important than in any others. Our thanks to George for that. A royal trip overshadowed. Prince William and Princess Catherine are on their second day of appearances in Boston. At the same time, there was a resignation at Buckingham Palace and a trailer drop for the upcoming documentary series, Harry and Meghan. ABC's Trevor Alt is in Boston tonight. <laughs> Tonight on their first trip to the U.S. in eight years, Prince William and Princess Catherine, as they say back home, carrying on in Boston. Meeting with environmental innovators and with children's groups, even this young fan. But their visit to the U.S. tonight shadowed by Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan after Netflix released a first look at their intimate documentary, strongly hinting they will open up about life inside the royal family. I had to do everything I could to protect my family. When the stakes were this high, doesn't it make more sense to hear our story from us? Critics noting the timing. The trailer, which doesn't even include a release date, still the decision made to put it out there with William and Kate here in the U.S. So far, no comment from Harry and Meghan or from Buckingham Palace, where tonight they're dealing with another crisis, damage control after accusations of racism by a member of the royal household during an event with Queen Camilla. A guest at the palace, Ngozi Fulani, a black woman born in Britain, saying Lady Susan Hussey, a longtime friend and confidant of the late Queen Elizabeth, repeatedly asked her where she was really from when she repeatedly told her, I'm from Britain. But Hussey kept asking, where are you from, even touching Fulani's hair. Fulani speaking out today in the UK. I experienced racism in an environment that I should have felt safe in, and we need to address that. Our thanks to Trevor for that. Still to come, what happened moments before a brawl broke out during a chaotic session of Parliament in Senegal and the battle over a precious resource found in so many of the devices we use every day. Author Chris Miller takes us inside the chip war. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's Bring how you start your, your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Drone video shows the devastation left behind by serious flooding in southern Brazil. Officials say rainfall was higher than what was forecasted, with some regions getting up to six times more than expected. At least two people are dead and a military fighter is missing after allegedly falling into the river and being swept away by the current. A brawl broke out in Senegal's parliament after a male opposition leader slapped a female politician in the face. 
Video shows lawmakers trading blows and one even throwing a chair. The initial slap apparently stemmed from a disagreement over the female lawmaker criticizing a spiritual leader who's opposed to current President Mackey Sal running for a third term. For the first time in the World Cup's 92-year history, it had an all-female refereeing team for a men's match as Costa Rica went up against Germany. Only six of the 129 match officials at this year's World Cup are women. President Biden is set to visit a semiconductor chip manufacturing plant in Arizona next week. From children's toys to nuclear weapons, semiconductor chips play a major role in powering our society. And as we all learned during the pandemic, they've become a precious resource driving so many of the gadgets that run our lives. In his new book, Chip War, the fight for the world's most critical technology, economic historian Chris Miller takes an in-depth look at the past, present, and possible future of the tiny tool. Thank you so much for joining joining us, Chris. Thank you for having me. So you write that semiconductor chips are the new oil, describing the battle for control over the market as one of the most important geopolitical stories of our time. And just briefly break down that, that battle for us, if you will. Well, right now, there are a small number of companies and a small number of countries capable of producing the most advanced computer chips, the types of chips that power your iPhone or your PC. And there's a struggle between these companies and countries to reach the cutting edge. And this is important not only for consumer devices, but also for military systems, because the future of military power will be defined by semiconductors. And today, the most advanced computer chips can only be produced in Taiwan, where the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, TSMC, produces over 90% of the most advanced chips. And as tensions rise between the US and China, the status of Taiwan, a contested island, becomes ever more dangerous in that context. In the book, you take the reader back in time, looking at the history of this technology and the often overlooked role that it's played in many major historical events. What are some of the unexpected connections that you found? Well, most people don't really think very often about semiconductors, but in fact, our modern lives don't work without them. But it's not just tech devices that require semiconductors, from uh, alarm clocks to coffee makers to dishwashers to automobiles, all sorts of devices today rely on computing power, and computing power requires semiconductors. So it's really hard to imagine modern life without them. Almost anything today with an on-off switch has a semiconductor inside. And during the pandemic, many Americans became familiar with these chips for the first time as we experienced a shortage and felt the effects as countless products were in short supply. What are some of the factors that you found contributed to this shortage? The key driver of the shortage was a surge in demand for semiconductors as people started working from home and as companies began to upgrade their data center infrastructure to deal with the surge in online activity, there was more and more desire for more chips. But for other consumers of chips, like the auto industry, for example, they struggled to source the semiconductors that they needed. Today, a new car can have hundreds or in some cases, thousands of semiconductors inside. And if just one or two are missing, you can't finish the car. And that's something that uh, automakers learned during the pandemic. Yeah, lesson that we all learned the hard way, I suppose. Uh, the Biden administration has now made this a priority. Have you seen the U.S. make any changes to rectify some errors that, that led to the shortage? Congress has passed a new bill called the CHIPS Act, which is going to devote around $50 billion to supporting chip manufacturing in the United States. And the goal is to reduce the U.S.'s reliance on chips produced in geopolitical hotspots like Taiwan and to make sure there's uh, more supply amid uh, potential uh, crises in the future. And this is going to have an effect in uh, incentivizing investment in new chip making facilities. But the reality is the industry is so internationally interconnected that it'll be hard to make a big change in the structure of uh, how chips are produced. The reality is that you just can't produce all chips domestically. And you write that China spends more money each year importing chips than it spends importing oil. In its efforts to compete with the U.S., what are some of the impacts of their continued advancement in this area? Well, China's had a 
impressive track record the past decade or so in moving forward in a number of critical spheres, designing more advanced uh, chips, for example, uh, and getting Chinese built chips into products like smartphones and PCs. And the U.S. government is worried about this, not because of the implications for smartphones, but because a chip that can work well in a phone or a PC can also work well in a military system. So the goal is to really constrain China's advances in computing capabilities and make sure that the U.S. retains its edge. And lastly, what are some lessons that we can take away from the history of this technology as we look toward the future? Well, the key driver of the history of this technology has been a trend called Moore's Law, invented by Gordon Moore, who is one of the co-founders of Intel. This predicted in 1965 that the amount of computing power produced by each chip would double annually. And this extraordinary rate of growth has made it possible for uh, all of the computing we take for granted. But there's no guarantee that Moore's Law continues into the future. And it could be after a couple of years' time that Moore's Law dies out and our ability to produce ever more advanced chips become simply impossible because they're too complex and too expensive to manufacture. Well, Chris Miller, we thank you so much for your insight and your time. His new book, Chip War, the fight for the world's most critical technology, is now available wherever books are sold. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. And still to come, this made me feel old. Wait till you find out how old Aladdin is. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out! It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. And finally tonight, it's the timeless classic you can watch from the comfort of your couch. Aladdin turns 30 this year, and ABC's Zareen Shaw has more on that magic carpet ride. From the art of animation to the bright lights of Broadway and all the way back to the big screen. We're saying we're only dreaming. It's the timeless tale of a poor boy on the streets of Agrabah who dreams of falling in love with a princess, finding a friend in a genie who can grant three wishes. So what do you wish? I really want to know. I don't know of any project that's been through that, <laughs> that many twists and turns. Alan Menken is one of the most prolific composers of all time, and alongside playwright and lyricist Howard Ashman, became key players in an era known as the Disney Renaissance. I want to be where the people are. Mencken staying with the Aladdin story through every incarnation, carefully adapting it for new generations. It's a balancing act uh, between being the keeper of the flame and being part of a new team. Ashman was an original team member on the project and grew very ill before the film even hit theaters. Howard was very sick, so, you know, his involvement at that point uh, was much more of a struggle. Ashman completed two of the movie's most memorable songs before passing, Prince Ali and Friend Like Me. So why don't you just ruminate whilst I illuminate the possibilities? I still look at those lyrics and think that, you know, they're as smart and clever and as complicated and catchy as anything he wrote. Lyricist Tim Rice tasked with a tall order. It was a challenge, and obviously I thought that any minute they might boot me off. 
just as they'd booted me on. But um, luckily, Whole New World in particular and the other songs worked well. Alan Menken and Tim Rice for Whole New World from Atlanta. In fact, it's been all downhill since then, if you think about it. <laughs> With the magic carpet ride continue. Jonathan Freeman playing the villainous Jafar, the only Aladdin actor who voiced a character and played them on Broadway. A lot of villains, you know, they they come and they go. They, <laughs> so I got lucky. It was a lot of work and it was very demanding. Uh, demanding in a different way than, than working on the film, of course. Robin Williams giving the genie his signature style of comedy. I'm history. No, I'm mythology. Now nah, I don't care what I am. I'm free. Now the role Michael James Scott plays eight times a week on Broadway. A wish come true for the actor. The fact that I'm a part of that and I am a part of what has come and what so many of my ancestors and so many of the people before me have fought for, the change is already happening. After three decades, Aladdin's lasting power is creating a more inclusive legacy from the actors in front of the camera to the team behind this Disney video celebrating both Diwali and Aladdin's 30th anniversary. Magical. Our thanks to Zareen for that. And that's our show for tonight. Be sure to watch ABC News, our special viral, A World Without AIDS, that airs tonight in ABC News Live. We'll have a lot more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.